Well, if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn to Mark 10 with us this morning. Uh, a few years ago, when we were in Israel the last time, um, our, one of our, our bus driver uh, that was with us for our tour, uh, he shared a story with me about this man who had acquired some property and had gotten this farm and he decided he wanted to put some animals on this farm. And so one day as he was driving down the road, he saw this horse farm and saw this horse. He thought, oh man, that's a, that is a beautiful horse. I should, I should buy that for my farm and that'd be great to have. So he stopped in and he found the farmer and he said, man, I, I saw this one horse out in your field and, and it is a beautiful horse. I would like to buy that for $500. To which the farmer said, no, no, sir, that horse doesn't look so good you don't want that horse, and, and I have other horses, that one's not for sale. He said, no, no, that's the one I want, he's a beautiful horse, I, I really want that horse, I'll, I'll give you $750 for that horse. The man, the farmer said, no, no, sir, that horse doesn't look so good, you don't want that one, buy a different horse. The man was starting to get agitated and said, I don't know what your problem is, but I want that horse, I'll give you $1,000 for that horse. Finally, the farmer said, well, sir, that horse doesn't look so good, but if you want them that bad, I'll sell them to you for $1,000. And so the man said, great, he paid him the money, and then he arranged for someone to, to deliver the horse to his farm. You know, this is great, I got this beautiful horse, and, and uh, things were starting to look great, but then the horse was starting to have some health problems. He uh, wasn't eating well, he wasn't coming to the barn and he wasn't sure what was going on, so he called the veterinarian and had the vet come by. And the vet checked out the horse and said, well, here's the deal. The, the horse is in great health, is in great shape, but the problem is it's practically blind. And he was, the man was furious. I can't believe he sold me that horse for $1,000. Went he went back to the farmer and he said, you sold me this blind horse. He said, I tried to tell you that he doesn't look so good. He said, but you wouldn't listen. Well, here we are in Mark chapter 10, and uh, we encounter a man who doesn't look so good, doesn't see so well. He's blind Bartimaeus, and we come to find is, what we come to find as we study the text, though, is that this man, blind Bartimaeus, sees way more than we give him credit for. He understands more and perceives more than most people do that have two eyes that can see. That's what I'm going to look at this morning. I want to read just the, the text again with you. I know we read it earlier, but read it with me quickly as we go. It says, Now they came to Jericho. He went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great multitude. Blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. And he, when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And then many warned him to be quiet, but he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. Then they called the blind man, saying to him, Be of good cheer, rise, he is calling you. And throwing aside his garment, he arose and came to Jesus. So Jesus answered and said to him, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, that I may receive my sight. And then Jesus said to him, Go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that you would guide our time this morning. I am so thankful for the opportunity to have your word that we can have open in our laps, whether in tablet form, whether in book form, but just study it together. And God, I pray that you'd help us to perceive the lessons and the reason that, that this account, this miracle is recorded for us in Scripture, that we learn, we learn the lesson from blind Bartimaeus to learn to see from the blind man. And so God, would you be with me as I speak? Help me to speak your words you'd have us to hear this morning. And may they touch our hearts in the way you desire. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, we're, we're traveling along with Jesus and his disciples, and I, I want us to really kind of join them on the road. I want you to kind of almost put yourself in Bartimaeus's shoes for a moment. And so in order to do that, we kind of have to, to, to activate some of our senses uh, and to, to, to sense the surroundings around us and the context of Bartimaeus. So the first thing I want you to do is I want you to, to smell with me for a moment. 
Now, if you, if you notice, and if you read the Gospel of Luke's account as well, it, it, it mentions them coming out of Jericho, it mentions them coming into Jericho, and you might be saying, well, which is it? Are they coming out of Jericho or are they going into Jericho? The answer is yes, because there is two Jerichos. Uh, there is the old Jericho that was conquered in Joshua's day and that had been left to ruins and is still ruins today, but there was a new Jericho that was built by Herod. It was a large city that uh, uh, it, it was, they're only about a mile apart between the two Jerichos. They're about five miles to the west of, uh, of the Jordan River and about 18 miles northeast of Jerusalem. And Herod decided he wanted to build this, this city back up and he built this new Jericho, uh, which uh, is about 3,300 uh, feet lower than Jerusalem. So this was his summer or his winter palace. He built massive walls around it, four large towers of, of security fortress. He, he built a, a theater and an amphitheater. He built the palace and he built all these gardens. You see, Jericho actually means fragrance. And he built all these gardens of, of all different kinds of, of flowers and, and roses. And, and uh, they, were, they were known for their roses, their balsam, their cypress. And honey was found there in, in abundance as well. And so to come into Jericho or to be near Jericho, you'd begin to smell. This is springtime. We're just outside of Passover. The blooms are all coming out. And so there's, there is blind Bartimaeus. He's smelling all the fragrances from Jericho, meaning fragrance. Possibly he smells the rose of Sharon. It reminds him of the Old Testament prophecies of, of the Messiah being the rose of Sharon. So, so we smell a little bit there this morning, but then I want you to hear. So again, they are just days before the Passover. And Jericho is on a main route that takes you from the north, from the Galilee region, and heads up to the temple. And so this was a main thoroughfare. There would be thousands and thousands, some say that up to hundreds of thousands of, of people would come into Jerusalem for the Passover. They say it would swell to three times its population and size during the Passover time. And if this is the main route coming from the Sea of Galilee region where Jesus has just spent his last three years doing ministry, you could imagine all the, the stories and things talked about. Did you guys hear about Jesus? Did, did, you, did you hear? I, I heard that he, he healed a leper. Oh yeah, well I heard that he walked on water. Oh yeah, well I heard that he calmed the storm and he fed 5,000 people and the stories that are being told about Jesus. And there's blind Bartimaeus sitting by the road seeking alms and he's hearing all of these stories about Jesus as these pilgrims are all coming by. And not only that, but they're, they're, all, they're all joyful coming up for Passover. People are talking and catching up and singing. There are songs that were dedicated in the Psalms that are known as the Songs of Ascent. As they would ascend up to Jerusalem, up to the temple, they would sing different songs. I want to put up on the screen for you one of them that possibly is being sung at this very time as they're passing by, uh, by Bartimaeus. It's Psalm 123. And so picture the scene. Uh, the group starts singing in Psalm 123, and, and you hear them say together, Unto you I lift up my eyes, O you who dwell in the heavens. Behold, as the eyes of servants look to the hand of their masters, as the eyes of a maid to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God until he has mercy on us. Possibly Bartimaeus begins to sing along with them. And he's, he's thinking about this. And wouldn't he love to see with his eyes the throne of God? To see the temple and to see God's splendor in that way. And as he sings this and he's thinking about this. And then possibly someone comments, look, here comes Jesus of Nazareth. Here he comes this way. And all of this, he's singing and he's hearing about this. And Bartimaeus says to himself, the same Jesus who heals everybody. And more voices join in in verse 2. Behold, as the eyes of servants look to the hand of their masters, as the eyes of a maid to the hand of her mistress, so our, hand, our eyes look to the Lord our God until he has mercy on us. And so Bartimaeus stops singing. He cries out, Jesus! 
Son of David, have mercy on me. And everybody looks over and says, shh, stop calling out to him like that. We're singing. And they continue on in their singing as they sing, have mercy on us, O Lord. Have mercy on us, for we are exceedingly filled with contempt. And he cries out again, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. Stop singing out. But Bartimaeus wouldn't be silenced because he's putting the pieces of the puzzle together. As he smells and he hears and he sees. You say, wait a minute, he's a blind man. Yeah, but he sees more than we give him credit for. He's starting to see the, the connection that, of what was prophesied about the Messiah is being fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And here he is coming up to Jerusalem and he recognizes this is his chance to, to, to connect with the Messiah. Do you ever wonder, as this is actually, this is the last healing miracle that Mark records it's actually, the, the, there's only one more healing miracle that Jesus does before his death, and that is actually healing the ear of Malchus, the high priest that Peter takes off. The, 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 many of the miracles are concluded in, at this point or coming to this point. Why this one? Why is this in all three of the synoptic gospels? Matthew actually records two blind men, Bar, or Mark focuses on Bartimaeus, but, but why this miracle? Why this blind, blind beggar? Well, I believe it's a stunning reminder of who Jesus, the Messiah, is to us. He sees the fulfillment of Isaiah 42, verses 6 and 7, that, that says that regarding the Messiah, that he be given to us, as a, uh, us people as a light to the Gentiles to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the prison, those who sit in darkness from the prison house. He, he wants us to see Jesus. That's what he's showing us. But even in this crowd working its way toward Jerusalem for the Passover, very few saw what this blind man saw. Very few recognized who Jesus really was. They couldn't see it. I'm reminded of Matthew Henry who once made the statement, there are none so deaf as those who will not hear, and there are none so blind as those who, that will not see. There was plenty that were going along singing the songs. There was plenty that were going to Jerusalem to worship at the temple, but they would not hear and they would not see. That's what Bartimaeus is going to show us this morning in this text. I want to break it down for us in just two portions as we're looking at kind of Bartimaeus' section and then how Jesus responds. So I want you to notice, first of all, regarding Bartimaeus, Bartimaeus' pitiful condition. And I want to notice the reality of his situation in this, first of all. There are three indicators here that tell us that Bartimaeus is in a rough spot. Physically speaking, especially, but also socially and otherwise. First, it tells us that he is blind. There's a great multitude and blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. He's blind. Now, blind people were very common in biblical times because of disease and, and lack of, of sanitary conditions. Uh, I was interested to read uh, recently that someone goes blind in our world once every five seconds. Seven million people go blind a year. Now, we hear that in America and we think, how could that possibly be? But the reality is, is in many other cultures, many other uh, countries, they don't have the, the reparative uh, procedures that we have. I talked with somebody on Wednesday, just had cataracts removed out their eyes. And when we were in Honduras, the optical department that, we were, that I was working and helping in with the, the clinic was such a, a busy area because they don't have the, the resources and the funding to be able to, to get care. Well, it was the same way back in biblical times. There wasn't curative methods. There wasn't glasses that you could get. And if you were blind, that's the way you were. But not only was it the, the physical stigma, but there was a social stigma to it. Because the Jews taught that blindness was a result of either your sin or your kids, or your parents, I'm sorry. 
You remember in John 9, when, when Jesus and his disciples come by, a man born blind from his birth, and they ask Jesus, who sinned, this man or his parents? Because that was the rabbinical teaching of the day. Uh, they, in fact, one rabbi that I read stated this. He said, there is no death without sin, and there is no suffering without iniquity. Now, he's right to some degree, but they are directly relating that to this sin. Another rabbi taught that even look lustfully at a woman's heels, that you would have children born with defects. So they taught then, if you were blind, it was because of either your sin or your parents. Now, the question is, is, is that right? Is it always that every hard thing that we go through in our life a direct result of, of our sin? Or the question is commonly asked, why do bad things happen to good people? Right? We've heard that question. It's actually a misunderstanding on two regards. One, because we, we categorize anything that is discomfortable to us as bad. But it might not necessarily be in the eyes of God. God may be working a greater, bigger plan and, and perspective than we understand. So to say that this is a bad thing to me, well, maybe God's using it in your life for a purpose. And the other, I think, incorrect anal- or statement in that is, is to perceive that we are necessarily inherently good people. We are sinners. That's our nature. So sometimes bad things happen to bad people. So, so why do, though, bad things happen? Why, why cancer? Why, why children dying of AIDS? Why do people lose their jobs? Why do those things happen? Well, I think just a couple of options or a couple of things just to kind of put in our minds as we think practical theology with Christianity Overall, the, pract- the overall theology of it is, yes, sin is to blame. In Genesis 1, God said everything he created was very good. There was no sin, there was no death, there was no, there was no decaying of any form. There wasn't all that, that, that fleshly wars. But we know that Genesis 3 happens and sin happens and, and so death begins and death is passed upon all men for that all have sin and, the, and our fleshly nature now is, is ramped up and we war one with another because of our flesh. So that's the, that's the generic reasoning that we would say yes is the cause of those things. Sometimes though number two as a reasoning is sometimes specific sin is to blame. Uh, for instance, we, we can't necessarily blame God for getting lung cancer if we smoked for 47 years. Sometimes those are a result of, uh, we see people that have lifelong STDs, and it's because of a promiscuous lifestyle they've lived. There is a result of choices, and so sometimes it is a direct relation to choices and decisions and things that have been done in your life. But third, sometimes the difficulty is for your good and God's glory in your life or even in someone else's life related to it that you may not even see. I have heard testimony and talked with people many times who, who came to Christ when they were going through a hardship or when someone they loved was going through a hardship and they observed that and they, they saw the church come together and to love and care for them. They saw the love of Christ and it drew them. How many times have you heard at a funeral someone coming to Christ? I, I've been thrilled to see that happen at numerous funerals that I've done. And God allows sometimes that what we'd call is a bad thing but to use that to draw someone to christ is that not mercy is that not god's grace in that situation i think of i think of fanny crosby who became blind as an infant we'd say oh how terrible that god would allow this lady to become blind and yet god used her in her blindness to write over eight thousand hymns of the faith for the church hymns like blessed assurance Praise Him, praise Him, to God be the glory, all because of Fanny Crosby. And she said, I am so thankful God allowed this to happen to me. So the first face that I see will be my Savior, Jesus Christ. God allows sometimes those things in our lives. And yes, they're discomfortable and they're hard. So what we see that Bartimaeus is struggling with 
He's a blind man. And, and then along with that, then, we find that he is a beggar. There's another thing, so, which was common for blind people to beg because they could not work or earn a living. And in that day, there wasn't the welfare programs. And so there was set up in God's program that you could ask for alms. And he's positioned himself in a pretty good spot right there by Jericho where all the crowds are going to be coming by. But, but there's a, uh, nobody likes to do that. Nobody likes to be a beggar in that regards. And, and so there he is. But another thing that I noticed, not only is he blind, not only is he a beggar, but notice it, say, it calls him Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus. Now, did you catch the redundancy in that? Because Bar means son of, So it's son of Timaeus, son of Timaeus. Now, those in that day reading this gospel, Mark's gospel, would have instantly picked up like, well, that's redundant. Why is he saying son of Timaeus, son of Timaeus? That's like when we say, I'm going to stop by the ATM machine, when it literally is an automated telemachine machine. Um, We we say something, something that are redundant, um, or like Yogi Bear once said, it's like deja vu all over again. We, we tend to sometimes say things that are redundant, but why, why this redundancy? Why Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus? What I found is when you look up the meaning of Timaeus, you'll find his name in the Aramaic, comes from the Aramaic word Tame, meaning impure or unclean. You know, it's elevating, it's, it's telling, it's screaming out. This blind beggar man, he is the son of an unclean, impure man. Think of the stigma that goes along with that. So this guy is in a tough spot. An outcast of society and probably the religious aspect of society as well. But not only is the reality of his situation, but notice the realization, though, that he has of his Savior. All of a sudden, the commotion changes And he's probably trying to figure out what's going on. And someone says, it's Jesus of Nazareth. We've heard all the stories about. Here here he comes. He's coming our way. And Bartimaeus recognizes his opportunity. cries out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. What he realized that all the others missed in their singing and Passover talk is he calls Jesus the son of David. You know, that's an interesting statement. How many other times have we seen that title in Mark's gospel to this point? You know how many times? Zero. This is the very first time in Mark's gospel that we see anyone has recognized and called Jesus the son of David, which was a very clear messianic title. It's the very first time, blind Bartimaeus. He recognizes from all that he's heard from all that he has kind of taken in, and he says, Jesus, son of David. Jesus, Messiah, will be another way that you could clearly put that together. Have mercy on me. And so people didn't use this term for anyone other than Messiah. How did he know that? How did he know that this was the Messiah? Because he had ears to hear. And he had eyes to see what others didn't see. As he sat by the roadside over the past few years, he had heard the stories about a man who opened the eyes of the blind. He had heard the stories about a a, a man who had freed people from demon possession and cured the lame and lepers and and had fed multitudes. And again, as I said before, he pieced together the prophecies of the Messiah that this was the fulfillment of Isaiah 42 and numerous other passages. But it's interesting what he cries out for. He's a beggar. He's a blind beggar. And he cries out, Jesus, son of David, give me money? No. Have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. He recognized his need. Consider this. Why why did Jesus come to us? Why, Why did Jesus come to our earth? Not because he owed us a favor, but because he's merciful. That's who he is. Do you remember when Jesus was being ridiculed for dining with tax collectors after he had called Matthew to come and follow him? 
He called Matthew, and then he went and dined with Matthew that night. And people are saying, why in the world are you eating all these tax collectors? Do you remember what Jesus said? We read it in Matthew 9. He said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus is a God of mercy. And to provide mercy to those who desire it. The reality is, as you see, each one of us are no different than blind Bartimaeus, the son of an impure man. Each one of us has our impurities and our faults and our problems that we have. We're all blinded by sin. It could be addictions. It could be pride. It could be sexual immorality. It could be greed. Or possibly one of the worst of all, self-righteousness. And not even recognizing that we have a need. But we all need to cry out for mercy. But here the people warn Bartimaeus to be quiet. And literally the word there, warn, means to chide him, to rebuke him. Hey, shut up. Don't, don't yell out to Jesus. You, you just sit down there, Bartimaeus. You just stay over in your corner. I mean, he was already a social outcast, so it didn't matter how you talked to him. It didn't matter how you looked at him or ignored him. He's a social outcast. How sad that the religious community would turn their back on him because they had deemed he wasn't of the cool crowd. He had problems. And if I associate with his problems, people might associate his problems with me. Well, I don't want that. You know what the church needs more than anything is to allow people's problems to be associated with us. And to say, hey, listen, yes, there's sin in the world and we're sinners too. And so we're going to come along and we're going to bear their burdens together. And we're going to care for them. We're not going to, we're not going to shun the blind Bartimaeuses of our day. We're going to come alongside those who are struggling with addictions. And we're going to come alongside those who are struggling with an, with an unexpected or unwanted pregnancy. And we're going to care for them. We're going to come alongside those who are, 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 are struggling with a past abortion. We're going to come alongside those who have, have a, a sexual immorality situation they went through. Because we care for them like Christ. I'm going to lead them back to repentance. Lead them to a right walk with the Lord. But he doesn't get deterred by that. Anyways, he, he knows how deep his need and he cries out louder and louder and Jesus hears him. So notice then, in our second point, as we keep moving here quickly, Jesus' personal compassion. We, we've noticed Bartimaeus' condition. We put ourselves in his plight. And it's so important to see Jesus' response and learn two things. First of all, that Jesus cares for needy people. Notice what happens. G, er, Bartimaeus cries out a second time, Son of David, have mercy on me. And notice... These next four words, so Jesus stood still. Isn't that awesome? Here is, here is the Son of Man. We saw last week that his eyes fixed on going to the temple. He is the Passover lamb. He's going to Jerusalem. And in all this entourage, all this crowd, thousands around him, and he's leading the direction, he hears this, and he stops. The whole parade stops. Because Jesus stops for blind Bartimaeus. Isn't that great? He says, this man matters to me. I care. I have compassion on him. It's the only time in the New Testament that you ever see that it says Jesus stood still. What caused him to stand still? A blind beggar, son of an unclean, unpure man. He stands still for him. That's who he is. Sometimes we can, in the midst of the storm, wonder if, if the truth that Jesus cares is really true. Uh, we're, we're like the disciples when they were on the, the, the Sea of Galilee, the first storm they went through, and, and, and they, they wake Jesus. Jesus, don't you care that we're perishing? Don't you care? Sometimes we're the same way, and we kind of come to Jesus in prayer. We come to God in prayer. God, don't you care? God, I'm going through this hardship. Did you, did you forget that I'm here? 
God says, no, I know, I know intimately my child. I, I know everything about you. I love you, and I care about what you're going through. On, on Wednesday night before the business meeting, we looked briefly at Psalm 147, and, which talks about that, that he numbers all the stars, and he calls them by name. In the discussion, we began to talk about some of the people said, yeah, I love the fact that not only does he know that, but he knows the very numbers of our ha- hairs of our head. We were talking about how he's having to change the numbers as they brush them out. And, um, but he knows the very numbers of our head. John 10 says that he knows his sheep. He calls them by name. He knows you personally. He knows everything about what you're facing. And so when we face struggles, and they're all around us, and they come into your life, and it's, bills, it's health situations, it's tragedy that's, that starts to build up in our lives. And he says, cast all your care upon me, for I care for you. First Peter 5, 7. Cast all your care upon me. Bring it to me. I care about your situation. Bartimaeus, I care about your, your plight. I care about your situation. You know, one way that we know that someone cares for us is in the fact that they can choose not to, if we can say it that way, by, by the freedom they have not to. For instance, if you, if you uh, wreck your car and your insurance pays you out so much money, you don't say, oh, wow, how loving they are. You say, well, how about time, huh? I've been paying on that for a long time. Because they don't have the freedom not to. But it's when you're going through a hard time and someone comes along and says, hey, I made you some, some, a meal. Or hey, can we just sit down and talk? And, and, and I don't have to do this, but I choose to. You know, Jesus didn't have to come to this earth. He, he didn't have to come and die for those who he had created and had rebelled against him. He had perfect freedom, perfect right to judge and say, I'm casting everybody into in eternal hell. But out of his mercy and his love, he cares enough that he came and died on the cross. He said, no one takes my life from me. I willingly, but I lay it down myself. It was his choice. So we come back to our text, and Jesus is stopping everything for this blind, outcast beggar. And he cares and calls for him. And so the people who were hushing Bartimaeus now earlier are telling him, be of good cheer, rise, he's calling for you. But, but notice what he does then. It says in verse 50, and throwing aside his garment, he arose and came to Jesus. The word there, throwing aside, is the word in the Greek, apobalo. It literally means to throw from you, throw far from you, to throw out. Why does he throw his garment from him? I mean, your outer garment was something that was a vital uh, article of clothing. It was a it was a vital piece of your of what you owned. In fact, it was the only thing that Jesus owned because it was what kept you warm in the cold nights. It was what you would use around you and, and and your outer garment was something you would take care of. Why would blind Bartimaeus sitting there by the roadside, hear this and take it and throw it? I think a couple reasons. Because, I mean, he's there in a crowd. Somebody might take off with his, with his garment. I think, I think one thing might be that he recognizes that I don't want anything to hinder me from getting to Jesus. If, if this is going to slow me down, I don't want it to slow me down, I'm going to come to Jesus. And, and there are things in our, in our lives that we've got to cast aside every weight we got to get those things out of our way. I think he also had total faith that when you go to Jesus, you come back changed. And he wasn't going to have to wander around looking for it because he'd be able to see. Bartimaeus had incredible faith in who Jesus was. And so we see there that Jesus cares for needy people. And the last point here is Jesus completely changes receptive people. So there is Bartimaeus, the son of impurity, standing before Jesus. And Jesus asks him, what do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, Rabbani, or master, it's a, it's a 
statement of high um, uh, respect, he says that I may receive my sight. Now, so he asks for sight. I thought about that for quite a bit, and I thought to myself, man, this would preach a whole lot better if he'd say, well, Jesus, you're the Messiah. I would that you would save me from my sins. I thought, man, wouldn't that be great if he had said that? I could, I could preach that easier if he had recognized, hey, more important than my physical is my spiritual. But what I begin to recognize is that Christ is, he doesn't, he doesn't, isn't upset with Bartimaeus for seeking this. It is right and appropriate for us to bring our physical concerns in faith to Jesus. And Jesus is glad to say, I'll heal your, I'll heal your sight. Your faith has made you well. It, he, he welcomes, bring those things to me. Jesus wants us to come with our every need to him. And, and I don't think he's upset with that at all. And he says, go your way, your faith has made you well. And the word well there is an interesting word. It's a term, it's, it's a word that's used in the New Testament for being saved from sin repeatedly in the Gospels. Not only does he heal him from his blindness instantly and permanently, but he also tells him, your faith has made you saved. Your faith has made you well. Because he could have used a different word for a, as, as made you healed. There's a different word in the Greek, but he doesn't use that word. Jesus completely changes Bartimaeus. He's no longer blind. He's no longer the son of impurity because he's cleansed, healed, forgiven, and he's no longer needing to beg. Bartimaeus' life is completely changed because he came to Jesus. And he came by sight because of what he saw. That Jesus is the Messiah. He's the one who cares. He's the one who can meet my need. And he cried out as we need to do. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus says, you can go your way. And he says, no, I want to follow you. Isn't that a great result? For when our lives are changed, you know what will, you know what will impact the church and the cause of Christ, the greatest, is if we get a grip on what we've been freed from. That inspires us to follow Him. The more we get to see who He is. So what are, what are some takeaways from this? What do we see from the blind man? What does He teach us? One, I think it doesn't matter who you are or what you str- your struggles are, that Jesus cares for you, that you can come boldly before the throne of grace to obtain mercy and help in time of need, Hebrews chapter number 4. I, I like the way A.W. Tozer said, he said, as God has exalted the right place in our lives, a thousand problems are solved all at once. I think what it tells us is bring them to Him. Bring your concerns because He cares. I think the second lesson that I, that I am drawing from this is as the church who is commanded to go and do likewise as Jesus, then we need to care for people like blind Bartimaeus. We need to have that same compassion for others around us. We need to be willing to, to stop the, the, the parade of our lives, the entourage of our agendas, put them on pause to care for someone in need. If that's who Jesus is, and we're to go and do likewise and be like Him, then it begs us to go and do the same thing. To pause and say, you know what, this is what Christ would do. And ask ourselves, am I, gonna, am I willing to, to put off a, my agendas to help care for people? I shared some statistics with you earlier on in our Gospel of Mark study that I think are helpful for us just to, to put in perspective the needs around us. On any given night in America, there are 554,000 people without a safe, regular place to sleep because they're homeless. Can you imagine on these cold times, not having a roof over your head? There are over 400,000 children in foster care in the United States with 73 right now in Center County that are needing safe homes. According to the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, the NSDUH, 
21.5 million American adults aged 12 and older battle a substance use addiction. Uh, There are 16.1 million U.S. adults that struggle with depression in any given year. 6.9% of all adults in the country. According to the Justice Department, on average, there are 321,500 victims aged 12 or older of rape and sexual assault each year in the United States. That's one out of every six American women has been a victim of attempted or completed rape in her lifetime. Roughly 15 million people are living with and battling cancer in various forms every year in the United States. More than 10 million victims of domestic violence and abuse each year in the United States. And we can go on and on recognizing statistics of of the mentally and physically handicapped, the the more than 1.1 million United States that are living with HIV today, the number of babies born to unwed mothers and checked out fathers. There are needs all around us. And if Jesus cares, if he's willing to stop, are we willing to do the same? So that's my two takeaways. Maybe you're the one right now saying, I need someone who cares for what I'm going through. Bring it to Jesus. Bring it to Jesus because he cares. And maybe you're saying, you need to ask yourself, am I being like Jesus? Am I caring for the needy around me? The people that are going through these situations. That's exactly why we partner with places like Pregnancy Resource Center. That's why we want to put a downtown ministry center in Belfast. And are working on that right now. Because that's what we believe the church ought to be. And to do. Blind Bartimaeus. Completely changed when he came to Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity this morning to be challenged from your word and to grow together. Lord, I pray that if there's any this morning that maybe they're carrying a a struggle, a hardship, and they're working through that, and, and, and maybe there's fear, anxiety that comes along with it. Maybe there's some are working through just different challenges. Father, I pray that they would learn from Bartimaeus, that we could cry out, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, have mercy on me. You're the, you're the Son of God. And God, we thank you so much for what you've done for us and loving us enough to, to give us Jesus Christ to be our Savior who died on the cross for our sins. Help us to cast all our care upon you, to not pridefully, self-righteously try to take it on our own. And God, I pray as well that you would help the church Help us as believers. Help the church collectively and in our communities. Help us to be like Christ. Help us to see needs and with compassion be compelled to stop and help meet those needs. God, we pray for the Living Waters Ministry Centers. We establish that right now and are working on that. And for those who are getting training to be, uh, to get uh, uh, certified as counselors and and with PRC, hopefully in the future, and as we work on all these different aspects and drug and alcohol rehab. and uh, Lord, I pray that, God, you would allow us to be like Christ in this community. Thank you for loving us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.